So, John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. You could turn in your analog or digital Bibles, if you will. John chapter 20. One. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. She then runneth, and come to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher. And seeing the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. So, only ten verses. Few things happen there. I mean, one very momentous thing, right? Jesus is no longer in the tomb where he was buried. And Mary Magdalene, uh, women were uh, the first to uh, to find this out here. You know, uh, and I've just got some words here that I'll kind of reiterate, kind of what I'm saying throughout this message, just to uh, just so it's a visual for you. You have the audio and the visual going, and uh, maybe it will be easier for you to take it in. Um, before we get into what this means for our application in our lives, I wanted to just reiterate that we can trust God's word. And this is a passage and other passages like it synoptically in the other gospels where they all present the uh, account of Jesus no longer being in the tomb. This is something that enemies of the Bible, uh, people who have chosen not to believe, um, use as an excuse not to believe because it looks like there are contradictions in the Bible. So people will point to, well, actually, let's just uh, let's remove any unnecessary barriers to anyone believing here. Let's just dive into another example of the tomb story. Mark 16, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the morning of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. So, question mark, was it Mary Magdalene who went to the tomb and found out that it was empty? Or was it Mary, Mary, and Salome? Or, like in Luke, is it these three and then a few others? How many people were there going to the tomb? So people will point this out and say, look, the Bible's full of contradictions. I don't need to believe that. I mean, I can't even get how many people went to the tomb in the morning straight. Uh, so there are three different ways of explaining this, if you're a believer. If you're an atheist, you know, you don't believe it, obviously. Um, so getting into some theological cemetery terms. I know I said cemetery. Um, inerrancy, the Bible has no errors, okay? So that's, if you believe that the Bible, every single word in it can be trusted and is true, no matter what it's talking about, and that it has no errors, you believe in biblical inerrancy. Then there's infallibility, which is different because people who believe in infallibility believe that the Bible is right only when it's talking about spiritual stuff. So 
If God says something about Jesus being the Son of God, that's obviously right. If God says the earth is flat, and we know that not to be true, the Bible doesn't say the earth is flat, by the way. But if the Bible did say that, then the infallibist would say, look, see, the Bible doesn't get science right, but it does get the spiritual stuff right, the stuff that we can't see or verify. Um, so that's what they point at. And then you could believe that maybe aliens did it too. Uh, so sticking with the first two, believers in inerrancy, inerrancy say about this tomb story, look, John doesn't say that there weren't other women with Mary. He just says that he was just talking about Mary. Okay, so he could have left out that there were, you know, three or four or five or however many other women with him. He's just talking about Mary. But there were other women there. So you would, if you're a believer in inerrancy, you would say that. And say you're talking to an atheist. Maybe like, ah, that seems like a stretch. Let me, let me tell you. So if, if Justin is telling uh, Dwayne here a story about Chick... And he says, Chick did this, and Chick went on this uh, trip to Wisconsin, and he, you know, said this during his, his teaching, and it was awesome. You know, and then he did this, and then another guy started crying, and then this happened, and this other stuff, right? And he, he did not mention my name once. Dwayne would, would be thinking, well, he, wouldn't, he would have no reason to think that Jim was there. He wouldn't be thinking, oh, okay, when's he going to get to the part about Jim, you know? He would just think, oh, you know, he's, he wouldn't even think about it. You know, it's just, why Jim isn't in this story, so you wouldn't infer that he's there, right? Um, so what atheists are saying is, look, you're trying to save the Bible, but really, this story says nothing about the other women, so that seems like a stretch. And then you've got a Bible scholar enters the conversation and says, well, wait a second. I agree, atheists, seems like a stretch. But the difference in the stories is actually a good thing. And most people's reaction would be, what? Now, if you were born before 1972, just tilt your head like this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But, uh, yeah, so that would be most people's reaction, right? So the Bible scholars would say, wait, no, let me continue. If there's 100% agreement between two stories, say you're an investigator like a CSI type, right? And you are uh, interrogating two people, and their stories line up exactly 100% the same, you might infer that these two people got together before they met you and uh, got their story straight, right? Worked out the details beforehand so they didn't uh, contradict each other. But if there's only significant agreement, now stick with me here, if there's only significant agreement, but it's less than 100%, and it, the, they didn't get all the details the same, then it's more likely that it's true, right? It's more likely that one guy's just leaving details out and the other guy's leaving details out. And, so it's, it's more likely that it's a true story and that they didn't collude beforehand. This is the infallibility argument. Okay, stick with me. Bible writers were inspired by the Holy Spirit, weren't they? So ask yourself, do you believe that the Holy Spirit helped write the Bible, that he did write the Bible by telling John, telling Mark, these other guys what to write? Okay. Do you think God wrote an inaccurate story? Why would he do that? What is the point of that? Ask yourself these three questions. One, if you are God, would you rather write a Bible that's pretty accurate or uh, instead of completely accurate? Yes or no? Question two, was it easier for God to give the Bible writers all the correct facts regarding the spiritual world, but too hard to give them the correct facts about the physical world? Like maybe Mark was too dumb to tell him about you know, how the, the earth is round and not flat. And again, the Bible doesn't say the earth is flat. Or, you know, who was at the tomb that day? And then question three, does God only care about spiritual facts? Do you just not care? Maybe he's like, oh, well, science will figure that out thousands of years from now. I'm going to let it go. So if you answered yes to all three of those questions, I would say you're crazy. And let's talk after this, okay? But if you answered no to any of those, then... The argument of infallibility here, that there's mistakes but that's okay, kind of has a problem. Most people who just got saved and are coming to the Bible simply as the Word of God and not with all this theological cemetery stuff or different people's arguments, they would read it simply and they'd say, well, I'd expect this to have no errors, right? Nobody comes to another conclusion just by themselves. They have to be influenced by people who have already made up their mind that God's Word is full of errors, okay? 
So the Bible should be error-free. You were just teaching the Bible simply. That's the argument you would, the conclusion you would reach. So we still haven't answered the question of why does one talk about one woman and another talk about three? Well, so for those of you who remember interns, and we listened to a, a number of different um, uh, teachings uh, by Pastor Chuck and some other people within Calvary Chapel St. Paul um, for this, this program that, uh, well, I won't get into why. But we're listening, I'm listening to this teaching of Pastor Chick from the C2000 series. And he was talking about how he prepared for teachings. And one of the things he said was, I start out my week and I read and I reread the passage probably about 20 times before I get to the uh, pulpit on Sunday. And I just, you know, in my own life, reading things once or, or I mean reading things twice or three times, multiple times, the Lord nearly always speaks to me even more and more revelation that second and third time. Like some of you, you've been here, you've been in Chick's teachings before, and you've seen him talk about some kind of truth in the Bible, and you've been like, was that even there before? I don't remember ever reading that. You know, and it just, the Holy Spirit, for whatever reason, flashes it up to your, uh, to your mind and, and makes you aware of a truth that you've always been reading over, right? So read and reread, and the Holy Spirit will give you the answers. John 20, verse 2. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Mary says, We know not where they have laid him. Why does she say we? You might ask. This is kind of, this is, so this is ancient, this is a, a, Koine Greek, which is the term for Greek that the people who lived in the Bible times wrote Greek in. It's different from modern-day Greek, which is why they come up with a fancy name for it. Um, but this is from blueletterbible.org. Side note, if you are ever doing a study on God's Word and you want to know some deeper stuff of it, um, some com you want to know good commentaries or you know, Bible dictionaries, things like that, blueletterbible.org. So I took a year of uh, Bible school. Um, in Chicago, and I'm not using anything I learned there today. But I did learn that it costs $600 to $1,000, easy, for a software package that, you know, pastors would get really riled up about having because then they can do these word searches and these cross-references and, and parse out, have it parse out for them the original Greek and show them how many times it appears in the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Blue Letter Bible does all of that. And it has commentaries from people within Calvary Chapel uh, and it's free. You don't even have to register for it. So definitely use that resource. Um, and these are a couple of snippets from the page on John 20, verse 2. So this is the part where uh, she is saying, and we know not where they have laid him. Uh, the word is pronounced oidamen, and it means uh, uh, we know. So it, it literally says, not we know where they have laid him. And the we know can only be we know. So I'm just showing you this because there's some people who might hear me say something and be like, yeah, but I don't believe you. I, you're just making that up or whatever. This is actually what the original manuscript said. Uh, this is the Texas Receptus version for those who care. Um, it literally says, we know. It can't be anything else. If it was I know, and she was talking about herself being the only one there, she would have said, I do, which is a completely different. I mean, you can't screw that up, right? So it's clearly indicating that there were multiple people there with Mary. And for whatever reason, John is just focusing on Mary. I think I know why. Here is my take on what happened at the tomb. So bear with me for just a second as I, and this isn't thus saith the Lord. You can do your own study and maybe you come to a different conclusion. But this is what I think happened. So, uh, oh, I revealed that too soon. Um, so here's, here's my take on what happened. So Mary goes to the tomb with a bunch of other women, okay? Uh, Salome's there. Mary, the mother of James, is there. Some others are too. And they, they get to the tomb with the spices that they've got ready to uh, finish off, you know, Jesus' uh, you know, burial process. And they get there, and they realize that the tomb has been opened up. And Mary, once she sees that the stone has been rolled away, takes off. Mary Magdalene splits. 
she goes to find Peter and John because she sees the tomb open. She's like, whoa, somebody took his body. The other women, so if you go back to John 20, uh, or I'm sorry, Mark 16, it, doesn't, it stops talking about Mary, and it just talks about the other women going into the, the tomb, and that's where they see the angels that tell them, Jesus isn't here, he's risen, what are you doing here? Go tell his disciples, especially Simon Peter. Well, so they, they go to go tell the disciples. Mary's way ahead of them. She gets, to Simon and Peter, she gets to Simon Peter and John first, and she tells this story to John. That's why he's talking about Mary Magdalene, right? So she gets there. She tells them what happens. They split, and they miss the women coming back from the tomb. They get there, and they see, oh, Jesus isn't here, and that's when John believes, okay? Mary goes with them. That's why when they leave the tomb, she's the only one left there, and she's the first one who gets to see Jesus in his, risen from the dead in his new body. So, how cool is God, right? There is absolutely no error in between the different stories, and they are not carbon copies of one another. So they are both more believable, and there is absolutely no error here. And it's all right there if you just read and reread. And just keep reading. And it just pops up, right? So God can truly have his cake and eat it too. It's amazing. Verse 1. I just wanted to give you that so that, you know, if anyone talks to you about the tomb story, hey, it's right there in the Bible. No contradictions. Verse 1. John 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and see if the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So here's a question. What if Mary Magdalene had slept in that day? That would have been a huge bummer. I mean, somebody else would have met Jesus for the first time. But what if she just slept in that day? Now, I'm not saying anything about people who you know, sleep late and are up late or anything like that. Don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm not talking against that. All I'm saying is, if God reveals something to you, Obey God's command. If he's telling you to, to stay up late because there's going to be some divine appointment, or maybe there already is, and you're in the middle of one, follow the Holy Spirit. Do what he's telling you in your heart to do. If he's telling you, like he told me, get up at uh, you know this hour, and uh, I really did not want to get up at this hour. and so, uh, But he's telling me, you know, do this. And I, I was blessed for obeying that, you know, and... Uh, we have a lot of illustrations of this uh, in the negative sense in the Bible, in that David didn't do what the Lord told him to do, and it, it ended up in disaster. So I'm referring to um, when he was uh, staying at home in his palace, and his army was out fighting the battle. He, that was when he saw Bathsheba, and that was when the whole thing with, if you're not familiar with the story, Bathsheba was a woman, she's married, David sees her, wants her, takes her, and then arranges to have her husband killed. And so, had he been in the battle that, that day, you know, I would be digging for another reference for this instead of using him in, as an example. Um, Moses, it's the same thing. You know, Moses, he uh, uh, was in the desert, uh, in the wilderness, and uh, was told to strike the rock one time. And he did, and water flowed out. And then he was told another time, speak to the rock. But he was so angry at the people of Israel that he struck the rock anyway. So the water still flowed out, and the people of Israel in the wilderness still got their water. But God took him aside and said, hey, you are not going into the promised land because you disobeyed my commandment. You misrepresented, if you, if you don't think that's a serious thing, you misrepresented God to everybody, which is huge. So a book that I read um, called Ordering Your Private World, I've got a copy of it right here. This is a, a great book. Um, read it during inter the entrance program that I was talking about earlier. Um, just if you're you know, struggling, you think that you, you don't have uh, you know, a lot of time or a lot of uh, um, you know, your life is disorganized or whatever, and I'm probably talking to everybody here in the room, um, this book really spoke to me in that regard. And uh, I'll read you a page uh, of it here. Uh, page 96. 
Um, He says, years ago, my father suggested that one of the great tests of human character is found in making critical choices of selection and rejection amidst all the opportunities that lurk in life's path. Your challenge, he told me, will not be in separating out the good from the bad, but in grabbing the best out of all possible good. He was absolutely correct. I did indeed have to learn, sometimes the hard way, that I had to say no to things I really wanted to do in order to say yes to the very best things. That's, I mean, when the Lord's speaking to me, that's what it's all about. I've got something else that I could choose to do, almost universally. I don't, I don't remember a time when the Lord has spoken to me and said, do this, and I've been like, well, I've got nothing else, so I'm just going to do what you say, Lord. And there's always something that, you know, I'm like, oh, in my flesh, yeah, did I really hear from the Lord? I still want to do this. And um, that's, you know, it's all about choosing to do what God is telling you versus the other good, quote-unquote, things that you could do. So examples that might apply to our own lives are, you know, yeah, Lord, but I still want to watch this TV show. Or, yeah, Lord, but, you know, everybody in my work gets drunk on weekends, and it's not like we're hurting anybody. We even have a designated driver. Or, yeah, but, Lord, everybody lies. It happens all the time. I do it every day. Why do I need to tell the truth in this circumstance? You know, uh, there are some things that look good out there, but we just need to trust that the Lord, when he's speaking to us, he's got other information even about what's going to happen in the future. And we just need to trust him when he's speaking to our hearts about what to do. Also in verse 1, you will notice, Mary did not see the angels until she looked into the tomb. This is also uh, um, uh, the other women. They didn't see any angels until they went into the tomb, and then there were angels there. Um, Why do I bring this up? She says an illustration. Do our actions show that we want to hear from God? Do you stay back from looking into that, that spiritual tomb of God's word or of whatever God is trying to show you? Do you hold back and... Um, just not want to hear from the Lord? I mean, he speaks to us when we, when we actually go out there and, and ask and seek and knock. Actually, great segue, Jim. Turn to Matthew 7, verse 7. Jesus, at the teaching on the mount, says this, Ask, and it shall be given you, Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And him, to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So the words of Jesus. He says, ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. So I'm reading this, and I'm a new believer. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that solves everything. Now that I'm a, now that I'm a believer, I know that Jesus is really in my heart. Um, uh, I can just ask him, and uh, I'll get the answer. So I'm reading the Bible, and um, I see something I don't get, and I say, all right, God, what's the answer? Crickets. Okay, God, what's the answer? Read it again. I still don't get this, Lord. And I still wasn't getting anything. I kept asking, and I kept reading, and I kept studying. And the answer eventually came, which I'm sure a lot of you have had similar experiences. Um, the words in Greek, and you can go to blueletterbible.org, blueletterbible.org. Check this out for yourself if you want to. The word ask that Jesus uses, the word seek, and the word knock are all what are called, don't memorize this, present active tense. Okay, So what that means is the word in Greek, so Greek is great because it very often has different things in it. Uh, different, like you can use a, a, you know, we have one word for love, and that is love. Uh, but Greek has three different words. And uh, in this instance, Greek has a different word for one kind of asking and a different word for another kind of asking. So what is he talking about? The word means ask and keep on asking. It means present tense means you keep asking. You are in the state of doing something. It's not that you asked once. There's a different word in Greek for asking once. Jesus is saying, if you ask and keep on asking, 
you will, you will receive. If you seek and keep on seeking, you will find. If you knock and keep on knocking, then the door will be open to you. So again, no contradictions between reality and what the Bible says is true. So I was talking with an atheist um, uh, a long while ago, actually, and he said, uh, you know, I don't understand why God doesn't just reveal himself to everybody. Like, maybe do it right away, right when they're born. You know, like, as soon as you come out, you know, like, screen pops up, there's God's head. Hey, I'm God. I created all this. You know, this is what you're going to do. This is what your life's going to be like. I'm real. Why doesn't God, if he's all-powerful, why doesn't he reveal himself to everybody? And my answer, as a young believer, I didn't really know what to say, but as a, you know, a believer who's been around long enough to know exactly what to do and still do my own thing, know exactly what the Bible says and still decide, ah, I'm going to go this way instead. I know. It's like, really, if God revealed himself to me, I would have even more judgment on Judgment Day. And so would you, atheist, you know, and so would you, whoever. If you knew for sure that God was real and you, you're still going to do the things that you do, you're still going to go your own way, and God knows that. You do not need more information, okay? If you're listening online and you're not a believer and you've got that whole tomb thing down, you use it to uh, convince all your Christian friends, if you have any, that you know God didn't write the Bible. Um, and I've already given you that information, and you still don't believe? You have just proved my point. So you do not need more information to believe. You do not need more proof. You need a new heart. Okay? It's, belief is a moral thing, not an intellectual thing. Verse 2. Mary is distressed. She's talking to Peter and, and, John, or, yeah, and John. And she thinks the Pharisee of the Romans or somebody came along and took Jesus' body. So she wasn't thinking about the scriptures that reveal what was going to happen to Jesus, right? Are we, in our daily lives, thinking and looking and watching for the things that are going to happen uh, to us that God is going to do? God is constantly doing things. And uh, it's not that he's constantly doing stuff over in Detroit that's cool, which he is. It's not that he's doing stuff in Costa Mesa or wherever. It's that he's doing stuff in your life. And if, you're not, if you don't have that, that uh, you know, those spiritual spectacles of God's word on, you're going to miss some of that stuff. So are you actually looking for God's hand working in your life? So an illustration of that we um, have a room now on the base, in the basement of this building. Uh, it's, a, it's a big, long room, and we're going to use it for, um, uh, for just children's activities. And uh, uh, some other brothers have been working and, uh, and getting it cleaned up and prepared. One of the things uh, that it was lacking was it's got 12 concrete pillars like this, and it's... A, it's a, it's an area that, you know, we want kids to be able to play in. But it's even, I think it might even be a little narrower than this between the pillars, too. And so if you can imagine having your, your three- and four-year-old class down there and the kids running around and concrete pillars everywhere, you know, so you'd know what a parent might think of that, right? So we want to wrap the pillars in uh, carpet and pad them so that it, it doesn't hurt when something, you know, happens. So um, we have no money for the carpets. We just got this room not too long ago. And uh, so just cold calling some people in the area, some different carpet companies, um, and saying, hey, here we are. We have no money. Do you have, any, you, do you have any carpet remnants that you're not throwing away that you just want to, you wouldn't mind donating? And I'm thinking, if we can find like, because we got 12 of these to deal with, right? And I'm thinking, I'm going to find like three feet here and four feet there, and, you know, we're going to have to, you know, get somebody's, somebody's buddy who knows how to stitch together carpet, you know. So um, that's what I'm thinking is going to happen. And I'm calling guys, and a lot of guys are like, yeah, you know, we can do something for you. I think we can work something out. So we sell them at a pretty steep discount. So I think for what you need, probably 400 bucks. Sound good? And I'm like, dude, that's a non-starter, you know. Click. So uh, get to a guy, um, 
and uh, if, you, if you're wondering where we got the carpet, it's, it's actually a really cool place, and I'll tell you all about it. And it just, well, uh, I'm talking to this guy, and I can feel like there's, there's some tension there. Like, he really does not want to be talking to me. And he's asking me stuff like, well, yeah, who is it? You know, what, what organization are we talking about? Uh, you say you guys have no money. What are you going to use this for? You know, and stuff like that. And it just kind of feels cantankerous, you know. And I'm saying, well, this is who we are, and we're church, and we have no money, and we just got this room, and we really want to bless our kids. And he's like, okay, so you're telling me you have no money and you have no plans on paying us for uh, the carpet remnants. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's, that's pretty honest. All right, well, go ahead, pick them up. And I could, it felt like there was still a little like hesitancy there, but he asked for our tax ID number, so I said, okay, I'll get right back to you. Hung up, looking for our, our church tax ID number for him to log it as a donation. Meanwhile, another brother sees the email that we need carpet, and decides to start cold calling people. And he gets to the company that I had just spoken with, and he's, he says, hey, we need this carpet. And the guy, not knowing that I had just talked to this guy, and he's like, all right, <laughs> fine, you can, you know, we got a trailer on back and you can come pick it up, you know. And so, I don't know, I mean, maybe the Lord, uh, Lord worked it out, though. So it's, uh, there's carpet places everywhere in the Twin Cities, this one is five minutes from my house, on the way to church. Uh, so it's like 10-minute drive, and it's like literally right in the midpoint. And we get there. It's a semi-trailer stocked full of nicely bound, wrapped, duct-taped-together carpet rolls, and they all are the same color. <laughs> so when we get it done, you'll have to go down and check it out. But there, I mean, so, I mean, that one's kind of obvious. It just kind of hits you, but... I mean, are we looking for stuff like that? Because God's doing it all the time. If you, you've heard Chick say it before, if you do not have God's word in your heart because you're not reading it, then what exactly is the Holy Spirit going to bring to your remembrance? Okay? So do we have time to read God's word? You talk about you know, managing your time well and picking those best things over the better things. If you don't have time to be in the word, and I totally fell into that camp, right? And you're thinking, but I got this and that and the other thing and all these responsibilities that I just cannot give up. Think to yourself, did God really make you the person that's trapped? Did he literally give you all these responsibilities that make it in no way possible for you to sit down and have five minutes with his word or whatever you might need? I don't think that happened to anybody. I don't think that, that is happening to anybody in this room. God wants you to be in his word and he will allow you to have that time if you just... Uh, dig for it. Just look for it. And that, that's something that the Lord is working on my heart in uh, a big way. Um, so, I, And I know I'm not alone here for sure. Um, if we have God's word in our heart, we're also going to see things that he has in his Bible that are going to edify us about what's going on in the world today. So you take, for example, like there's lots of prophecies about, um, I mean, Jesus fulfilled tons of prophecies about his coming. And there's prophecies about Israel being destroyed, them being a nation again. But all that's kind of, it's been fulfilled. Maybe not in its fullest sense, but it's cool to see it have been done. But this is a prophecy in Isaiah 17 that has not been fulfilled yet. It says Damascus will cease from being a city. Okay? And before the Arab Spring in uh, 2011, it would have been like, well... Okay, but I don't see that happening. I mean, yeah, the Middle East has some turmoil in it, but it always has, right? And now you look at what's happening in the newspapers today, right? What are they saying? That Syria is on the, has been on the brink of collapse for two years, and now we're talking about chemical weapons and, and uh, potential intervention from the U.S. and Russia and just all these things. And, you know, most people read that and think, oh, yeah, the Middle East, they're fighting again. But we can read it and be like, wow, this, could this literally be that prophecy being fulfilled in the process right now? I mean, just stuff that really edifies you. And like, hey, we're in the last days, man. Just some observations. Verses 5 and 7. In verse 5, John and Mary had to stoop down to see what was in the tomb. I don't know why they had to stoop. I'm assuming it's because that's the only way you could see in there. I haven't been to Israel yet. So I don't know what the uh, four or five tombs that they've got that they think are Jesus's tomb, uh, you know, look like. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bet, and this isn't thus saith the Lord. You probably 
for the real one, if, I mean, if you don't have to stoop to see in those, they're probably not the real one. That's just me. I don't know. Maybe when I get there, I'll change my mind. But that seems to be what the Bible says. And I'm only talking about this because I'm excited to go to Israel. So do with that what you will. Why did Jesus, where did Jesus get his clothes? So he gets raised up. He leaves his grave clothes there. We know that uh, the resurrected body of Jesus can do all sorts of cool things, right? He can go through doors while they're still locked. He can disappear. He maybe, I'm speculating here, but can change his, you know, his appearance so that people don't notice who he is until he's ready to reveal himself. Cool stuff. Maybe Jesus can just think, and boom, there's the clothes, right? So maybe you know, some of you women will enjoy this new feature when you get your glorified bodies of being able to be like, bam, you think about it, and you know, here's, here's the new dress, and you don't like it? You think of another one, right? You think of another one, and then we guys will be so happy because then we don't have to take you to the New Jerusalem Mall. So everything will work out perfectly. <laughs> Just observations. Verses 8 and 9. Mayor, or, uh, John comes to the tomb and he sees that Jesus isn't there and just, it's just grave clothes and then he believes. Right? If you don't understand what you're reading, I tell this to the, the kids because I, I, for the first time ever, had the three to five year olds in, uh, some of you have the three to four year olds in your class. I have the three to five year olds in my class and I've never taught little kids before. So, like, it's completely, completely different style. And I find myself constantly be like, okay, just take it in. If you're on, you'll understand it later. And uh, God does that to me all the time. You know, I'm, I'll read things, and I literally just have to trust that he is going to bring it up later and that I'll need it. But I need to take this stuff in. I need to take the word in. It happens with Proverbs a lot. What came to John's mind when he saw the burial clothes there. Talk about having God's word in your heart and having it stored there. Maybe he thought of Isaiah 53, 7, and 8. Why don't we turn there? Isaiah. Fifty three verse seven. So it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. This is a prophecy about Jesus. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. So maybe he thought... This is it. Jesus was literally cut off from the land of the living. And for uh, the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And uh, maybe he thought of uh, Matthew 16, verse 21. Now, it wasn't written yet, but this is where Jesus is telling him. We'll go there. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. So John, maybe he's doing the math in his head, okay, three days. Sees the garments there and thinks he really did rise from the dead. Now, if you're not spending time in his word, what is he going to bring to your remembrance when, he, when the Holy Spirit desires to do those things? I already told you guys about children's ministry, but that's why we're talking about John chapter 20 today. It's just I was preparing for children's ministry two weeks ago, and this was our, this was our verse. Maybe it was three weeks ago, two or three. And uh, I'm reading it, and I'm getting tons of stuff, reading it, rereading it. But none of it seems like it's for three- and five-year-olds, right? And lo and behold, it's for you guys. So praise the Lord. Proverbs. So I mentioned Proverbs. You know, Proverbs 25 for me the other day was just, oh, I'm not getting anything out of these. You know, I'm, maybe it was my 
I don't know if it was just me or if it was literally, you know, God only had one thing for me that day, but I'm going through them and I'm like, none of these are really speaking to me, Lord. And uh, then I get to the very last verse, and praise the Lord, I didn't give up because it was just awesome, blew my day away. Um, I won't get into it now for time's sake, but Proverbs 25, verse 28 says, you guys will probably get there before I do. He that hath no rule over his spirit, over his own spirit, is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So back in you know, ancient days, you needed a wall if you are going to have a city, right? Otherwise, you can be attacked from any side by anybody. But if you've got a wall, then you're safe. And at least if they break through the wall, you know, they're coming through one spot or whatever. But, so walls were integral. And uh, if you don't have control over your own spirit, you're going to be like that. Sin and the devil is just going to distract you here. Or he's going to distract you there. He's going to do both, probably. And you just have nothing to go for it because you're not controlling your spirit. You're just doing whatever your flesh wants. That yeah, verse really spoke to me that day. Verse 10. Why? Why? So you're John. You're there at the tomb. You see that Jesus has risen. And the Holy Spirit brings these things to your remembrance. And you're like, wow, let's go home. I mean, that's not the first thing I, th- first thing I think is let's go find Jesus, right? Like maybe he didn't get far. You know, but they went home for whatever reason. When God reveals something to you, what do you do with it? Oh, now it makes a little more sense. You know? uh, Well, let's just read this. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 23. James chapter 1. Verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It's about applying the word. And you know, at the end of this, the end of verse 25, what does it say? He not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It's a guarantee. Now that's, I mean, there's lots of promises in the Bible, but it's still cool to see one pointed right at you saying, hey, if you apply God's word, you will be blessed in what you're doing. It's a guarantee. Application, just to sum up what we've talked about here today. You need to be looking out for God's hand in your life and in other people's lives, especially you wives who are married, you know, um, looking for God's work in, in your husband's lives and just uh, be on the lookout for what God is doing, you know. You see something weird, you don't think, I mean, with that carpet thing, I was like, you know, if I wasn't a believer, I probably would have said, wow, that was weird. But instead, I'm a believer, and I said, wow, that was weird. Praise God, you know? So you just be on the lookout for stuff. Trust. Trust God's word because it is without error. It is living and able to speak to you and today. It's not that we only get something out of God's word or the Holy Spirit only speaks to us every year or every six months or whatever. It can speak to you today. And you can trust that it's completely without error. Apply. You will be blessed in your deeds. So just, you know, if you took notes, go over your notes again this week. If you didn't, you can always pick this up online again. Or maybe the Holy Spirit will just bring things to your mind that you just need to choose to focus on. But if you apply things from God's word, you will be blessed for doing so.